Hi there, everyone. This is Sabrina from the Institute for Enology and Viticulture, celebrating 20 years. You can see that in our cool new logo that we've got here. I'm coming to you from my dining room table during quarantine, giving you an introduction to wine phenolics. I had a lot of fun making this presentation, mainly because I got to play with the color on the slides. <laughs> So I'd like to set a few expectations for this presentation. So this is meant to be more of an introduction to the different classes of compounds that we're seeing in wines. So if you're interested in more practical management, I encourage you to see my tannin and color extraction presentation, which is also available on YouTube. And uh, people who have seen my YouTube presentations before are more likely Masters of Wine students. This presentation today is oriented towards my students at the Institute for Enology and Viticulture. However, I think it has a lot of value for many different people in many different fields of study. So what are phenolics? I'm going to have a little bit of fun here. I think I can utilize my pen feature uh, for the very first time, so bear with me. Phenolics are a benzene ring attached uh, by one or more hydroxyl groups. So here's our benzene ring right here, and this guy right here is our hydroxyl group. Polyphenolics contain multiple phenolic groups, or phenol groups rather. So these are the ones that are uh, present in grapes and wine. We don't just see these units just floating around in wines. What we see is them bound together in larger structures. So what are phenolics to wine? These are the chemical compounds that contribute organoleptic characteristics to our wine. So these are really significant for red wines and they can include the color, taste where we have flavor in conjunction with a tannin which provides some sort of additional sensation like say for example the flavor of chocolate has a tannin con uh, contribution to it. The straight up astringency and bitterness in the structural tannins of wine come from phenolics and also phenolics are a pretty decent antioxidant because they mop up oxidation products, including acetaldehyde. So this increases the ability for our wine to age. And where do these phenolics come from? Mostly from the grape. So they're coming from the skin and the seeds, but they could also come from the stems like the rachis and peduncle or even leaves if we don't sort them out appropriately during receival. Phenolics can also come from the contribution of new oak, and we'll discuss that a little bit at the end of this presentation. When I was learning about phenolics as an undergraduate, I was presented with this table here, which shows the relationships in between the different types of compounds. And I used to use it when I was teaching about phenolics as well, but I have seen the error in my ways, and I feel like this actually can lead to some confusion. So if you're a phenolic chemist, I'm sure that this chart makes a lot of sense, but for um, beginners, I see that there can be a lot of confusion here. So to illustrate that, I'll just mention our phenolic acids that we have right here. So there are three different types of compounds that we can discuss that are phenolic acids, hydroxybenzoic, hydroxycinamic, and then these hydrolyzable tannins right here. So hydroxybenzoic acid, an example of that could be gallic acid. These uh, gallic acid can be derived from oak, um, but also can be derived from um, stems. Hydroxycinamic acids um, are present in the pulp and they're significant to white wines. And also they are the precursors for Brettanomyces aromas. And then hydrolyzable tannins are the main tannins that come from oak that knit up with our grape tannins to form really nice, stable, polymerized, mature tannins in oak-aged wines. So you can see that these things are all cousins, but they don't really function the same. So I want people to understand that even if things can structurally look quite similar, you know, in the chicken wire structure, they may not act the same. So for our discussion, we're going to be breaking down um, things that are more functionally related as opposed to things that are very structurally similar chemically. 
So moving into the significant phenolics of red wines. So these include catechin, tannin, and anthocyanin, or more, you know, generally seed tannins, structural tannins, and the color compounds. So we're gonna start from the bottom with catechin. Catechin is a monomer of tannins. So it's the original building block of these structural tannins that make up the structure of our wines. These are strung together in chains um, to form that structure. And catechin is mainly derived from the seeds. Um, additionally, it can be derived a little bit from stems if people are choosing to do stem inclusion during fermentation. So these catechin monomers become less extractable over time in mature seeds. And this is because oxidative reactions cause these tannins, these little tiny tannins, to knit up together into larger, more complex tannins that form that more mature tannin in our mature seeds. So people who have tasted in, um, for maturity in the vineyard, you're looking for those nutty sort of seeds, not the green ones that are bitter. And that's a function of those catechins knitting up into these longer tannins. And additionally, during that maturation on the vine process, we also have a waxy coating being formed on our seed. So that also protects these catechins on the inside of our seed, so that they're less extractable during the winemaking process. So basically, it's a twofer. And we have two diagrams here. This one right here is catechin, and this guy over here is epicatechin. They're basically identical. They're isomers of each other. The only difference is that they're mirror images. So here, this main catechin, this bond is coming out of your screen. And then this one, the bond is going into the screen. Functionally, they taste the same, they act the same. Basically, they're just isomers of each other. I think catechin becomes really exciting when we start chatting about it in the context of catechin tannin ratios. So this is a way to compare how much catechin in a wine or a, a fruit sample is there in relation to how much overall tannin is there. And this has implications for flavor and quality in a wine. So if we take a look at these catechin tannin ratios here in this chart, this is from ETS Laboratories. Thank you so much, ETS. So this chart here shows a six week harvest window on Syrah from California, from a single vineyard, from a single block even. So there was six weeks of harvesting and then these wines were vinified separately and then the catechin tannin ratio was assessed here. And what we can see is in the earlier harvest weeks, the catechin tannin ratio was higher because the fruit is less ripe and it's more seedy. The seeds are more extractable and there's more of those bitter catechin tannins that are available. As the fruit becomes more mature up until week four, that ratio goes down because the seeds become less extractable and the catechin becomes knit up into more mature polymers. And then, things kind of flatten off after week four. There's a little bit of a bump in week five and six. Um, and basically the seeds have stopped ripening. We've really reached a plateau here. And I think this is fun. Uh, so students of mine are probably familiar with my wine database, again, thanks to ETS Laboratories, where we had um, analyzed about 200 different finished wines from around the world. And this is the sub, or the set of Pinot Noir versus Syrah. So we have 15 Pinot Noirs from Burgundy, California, um, Australia, and New Zealand. And we're comparing that to Syrahs. So these Syrahs are coming from uh, Northern Rhone Valley, Australia, California, and Washington. And what we're doing here is we're comparing the average catechin to tannin ratio. And what we can see as expected in Pinot Noir, which is a much lighter style of wine, the tannin tends to be lower and simply enough just due to the quality of the fruit or the, the genetics of the vine, we tend to have more seedy tannins. So we have this larger ratio of catechin to tannin. 
And on Syrah, as one would expect, it tends to get pretty ripe. Those seeds aren't very extractable and the ratio is really low just because we have so much tannin present in those wines. So catechin tannin can tell us how seedy a wine tastes. And uh, fans of Pinot and Syrah will know that uh, Pinots tend to be you know, lighter, maybe a little bit more, not necessarily bitterness, but um, it's basically not a very fat wine, it's thinner and more elegant whereas the Syrahs just tend to be burly and structured. And that's because we just have so much more tannin present compared to the small amount of catechin. Now we are moving into the meat of our discussion, which is larger tannins. So this is the pretty exciting section. So condensed tannins and the word tannin are usually used interchangeably. So let me see if I can get my little marker here. You can see that these condensed tannins are made up of these monomers of catechins. You can see this guy here is a catechin and it's attached to another one. And these chains can be really quite long. So these are all just small monomers of tannin glued together into something that's longer. Um, chemically, the word condensation basically could be used as, as bonding. So condensed tannins, it refers to bonding these tannins right there. And these condensed tannins can be really quite complex. So here's a, a nice hypothetical diagram over here. We've got our little monomers that are chained up into a longer chain. This N here means that we could have a, a long chain of variable length here. I can even have a nice little subchain right here. But in actuality, these things tend to be a hot mess. So there's lots of modification, um, lots of side chains. There might even be an anthocyanin thrown in there, and we'll talk about that later. There could be other things trapped in there like metal ions or polysaccharides. So this thing is just kind of a rat's nest, including tannin. So it's not going to be as pretty as this simple diagram that we conveyed. And when that rat's nest gets big enough, it comes out of solution and it precipitates out. So when you see aged wines in bottle with that residue on the inside there, that's um, that condensed tannin, which is formed into such a giant mass that it is precipitated out of solution. The difference between seed tannin and skin tannin has been of great interest for winemakers for a long time. So here's an example here of a seed tannin. So these guys tend to be a bit shorter. Um, they're usually about 10 subunits and they're actually more abundant in the berry than a skin tannin. And because those subunits um, are fewer than a skin tannin, we get more of a bitter sensation. So here we have an example of a skin tannin. And if you remember the previous slide on those B rings, so the B ring is this ring right here, you would have two of these hydroxyl groups. But on these guys, we have three of them. So these little monomers, or the, excuse me, the, the, the subunits here, these are gallocatechins. And these actually have a more velvety texture that they contribute to the wine. And because these chains are longer, the average length is 32 subunits compared to the average length of 10 in those seed tannins, we do have more richness and astringency as opposed to hardness and bitterness that may come from those seed tannins. But it's easy when taking things at face value and looking at the chicken wire to place a value judgment on them, you know, skin tannins being much more desired, seed tannins not being because they're just in general more bitter. But um, there are plenty of wines that have over-extracted skin tannins, and there are plenty of fine wines that have a high proportion of seed uh, tannin contribution. I can actually think of some really nice burgundy wines that would have maybe more of those seeds, just because, seed tannins, because they come from a cooler climate where the seeds are a little more extractable. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the wine is of inferior quality. So um, these things are different. And historically, 
a lot of winemakers, especially ones from uh, the new world, have been more interested in pushing that skin extraction. But um, there's a place in wine quality for skin and seed tannins. Aldehydes are really important in the formation of these longer, smoother tannins. They act as a bridge in between these smaller catechin units. So this process does require oxygen because aldehyde, um, more specifically acid aldehyde, is um, an oxidized ethanol. So um, oxygen is required, and these aldehydes can basically form the glue in between these units. So this can happen naturally in the semi-oxidative environment of barrel aging on reds. Additionally, new oak um, has aldehydes like um, furfural, which is the caramel aroma, and this can also act as the glue in between these small little tannin monomers. And now we're transitioning into my favorite topic, which is anthocyanins. So these are the pigments that uh, generate the red and purple color in our wines and in our grapes as well. So these guys are anthocyanidins, which are glycosylated. So let me get my little marker here. So this guy is an anthocyanidin. It's got a very similar structure to those catechin uh, tannins that you were seeing earlier, but it also has a sugar attached to it right here. So anthocyanins don't contribute much to the taste of a wine. However, they actually do have some significance in modifying tannin perception, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that later. Anthocyanins can have additional complications because anthocyanins can be esterified to different acids, and I swear I'm actually going somewhere with this. So, Take a look at this example right here. So this is Malvadin-3 paracumaro 4 glucoside. So this is the Malvadin section here with the glucoside because that's glucose. And then here is our cumaric acid that's attached right here. And we can have different types of acids that are esterified at this position. So this one has cumaric acid, but you could have caffeic acid or acetic acid. And this has some really interesting implications because there's unique signatures for specific varieties. So if we're seeing different anthocyanins pop up when we're not expecting them in a wine, it's an indication of adulteration. And there are general trends in the relative concentration of anthocyanins in wine. So around 60% of anthocyanins are uh, in a specific species called malvidin, but that really doesn't tell us that much. So the acylation, which we were mentioning before, that's the thing that's bound to the sugar, is where things get interesting. So about 70% of anthocyanins that are out there don't have any acylation at all. And about 15% are acetate and about 15% are coumarate. So um, the variation here can tell us about different cultivars or varieties. So a, a good example of this is Pinot Noir. So it doesn't have any acylation. So basically you just have the main anthocyanin unit. There's no acid attached to it. So if we see anthocyanins with acids attached to them pop up in our Pinot Noir, we know that it's not pure Pinot Noir. So here's a real world example of that um, from about 10 years ago. And this was a brand that Gallo had called Red Bicyclette, and it was French Pinot Noir, uh, mainly from the Languedoc. And their suppliers had been cutting Pinot Noir with less expensive Merlot and Syrah to up the volume, and uh, Gallo was not aware, and uh, the courts did rule in Gallo's fav favor on this. So they were able to trace that using anthocyanin markers. And anthocyanin markers get really interesting when we start looking at malvidin diglucoside here. So this compound, this is something that we've been looking at before. So this is our usual anthocyanin. It's got its sugar attached to it. But malvidin diglucoside here has another glucose, hence diglucoside. So this is a highly red compound and it's only present in French American hybrid grapes. 
And mega purple and mega red, which are used in the wine industry as a way of adding additional color and maybe even a dash of sweetness to a wine, um, those uh, products are derived from French American hybrids. So if you have the prevalence of malvidin diglucoside in a wine, it's an indication that mega purple or mega red was used. Um, one caveat to that is, well, if your wine's a hybrid, then of course you're going to have melvin and diglucoside in it. But what I mean for that is or in, in the premium wine industry, looking at, say, Pinot Noirs or Cabernets um, that have melvin and diglucoside in them. So that would be an indication that we had uh, some of that concentrate used. And here's an example of this. So redacted producer here, not mentioning any names, but I'll say that this is a Napa Valley Appalachian Cabernet Sauvignon in the 70 to $80 price range. And yeah, you can see that on the surface right here when you look at it, 15% alcohol. Let's take a look here. Oh yeah, lots of tannin. But if we look down at the bottom here at the malvidin diglucoside, this is starting to show up on our report. So this is analyzed by HPLC. And what we can see is that we have the presence of malvidin diglucoside. So 47 milligrams a liter, that's actually quite a lot. And if we take a look at the total anthocyanins here, we have 280. So about 15% of the color in this wine is actually derived from this outside source. Onward to less controversial content here. Anthocyanins can be pretty easily bleached by sulfur dioxide. So I'm gonna get my little pen out here and uh, try and draw in this aromatic compound. Oh my gosh. So if you're hearing crinkling in the background, Digby just sat on some tissue paper. <laughs> so I'm sorry if I'm a little distracted here. So we have these anthocyanins and this central ring right here needs to be aromatic for uh, the anthocyanin to retain its color. So by aromatic, I mean like the charge moves around in the circle here, round and round, and we have a series of double bonds. But when this bisulfite guy here shoves its way in, we have that disruption of that aromatic ring and the anthocyanin loses its color and it goes colorless. So to retain your color, you have to try and avoid this. However, this isn't really possible in actual winemaking. But an example of um, at least being prepared for this kind of stuff is rosé winemaking. Oh, and Digby's eating the tissue paper. So with rosés, it can be good to slightly push the color initially because as you go through your first sulfur dioxide add, and then also as you dial in your sulfur dioxide right before bottling, you're gonna be getting a color bleaching effect. So if you overshoot the color, um, you won't bleach your color away entirely when you stabilize the wine before bottling. Anthocyanins can express two main colors, a more pure red form or a more violet form called the quinoidal form. And uh, additionally, like I mentioned before, there can be a colorless form. The color expression of the anthocyanin is really pH dependent. So if we're at this lower pH, we have more of the anthocyanins in this flavium form, which is the more red pigmented form. And if we're at a higher pH, we have a higher proportion in the conoidal form, which is blue. Additionally, there's a, a sizable contribution from these carbonyl forms, which actually have no color at all. So when we go up in pH, we actually lose color density. However, um, I don't think that this is something that our eyes can really detect. Um, for an example on color differences with regards to pH, I like to use the example of um, Chianti from Tuscany, um, made from Sangio, compared to Rocks District of uh, Milton Free Water Syrah. So Sangioveses tend to have a lower pH. We might see something closer to 3.5, 3.4. And on some of those rock Syrahs, um, actually almost all of those rock Syrahs were over pH 4. 
Um, and in those wines, you don't t tend to see that pure cherry red color anymore. You tend to be seeing kind of a darker, more kind of purpley, um, almost like a purpley brown in a way. Regardless of what form those color compounds are in, they are still vulnerable to being bleached if they are in the monomeric form. So polymerization of these color compounds is essential for their stability long term. There's two mechanisms for this. One is short term and it's copigmentation. And the second is long term. And that's where the color compounds have to bind up with flavin threols, so that would be other small tannins, or the formation of pyranoanthocyanins. So this would be binding with pyruvic acid, which is a byproduct of fermentation. So you can see we've got our anthocyanin here, and it's binding up with pyruvic acid to form this other ring here, which in turn protects this central ring right here. Additionally, color compounds can uh, react with grape and oak derived other flavonoids. So that means um, maybe a catechin plus a barrel aldehyde. Uh, so that would be like a caramel aromatic plus a catechin plus a color compound. And that would be nice and stable as well. So this chicken wire mess here is an example of what these aldehyde induced tannin tannin or tannin anthocyanin reactions look like. So aldehyde forms the glue in getting anthocyanins and small tannins to stick together. So this is key for the long-term stability of the color. And here's a simplified version of this, thanks to Staven, which is a barrels um, product supplier. So we have these chains that are forming up. Let's see if I can get my uh, marker here. So you can see that this is sort of an oligomer. So we've got four tannins, little catechin tannins stuck into a chain. We've got these monomeric anthocyanins and we've got these um, aldehydes here. And with um, oak and oxygen, um, oak providing maybe some of the aldehydes and oxygen providing aldehydes as well, we get these chain formations where the tannins knit up together with aldehyde as the glue. And then we can also have these terminal units here of color compounds. Once you have a color compound on the end, this tannin can't grow anymore. Those are the terminal units. And here's a further simplification of this, which I really love because I, like I think pretty much any other kid, love shoving raspberries on their fingers uh, when they were out in the garden. So a tannin is like an outreached hand. Um, those fingers can scratch. Um, they uh, provide some astringency, but once we pop those color compounds on the end of that tannin, it's squishy now, and also the color is secured. So um, this can have a major implication on the smoothness perception of the tannin that we have in our wine. So this brings us into polymeric anthocyanin into tannin index. So that is the ratio of those stabilized colors, so tannins with color attached, compared to the overall tannin of the wine. So to think of stereotypes again in our mind, um, a wine with a very low polymeric anthocyanin to tannin index would be something like Nebbiolo. Um, wines, especially things like Barolo or Barbaresco, they're light in color, but they're high on tannin. And when you taste those wines, they have a lot of structure, um, but they're not very plush and squishy. And then compare that to something like Barossa Shiraz, where these are very inky wines with also a large amount of tannin, but the color is attached to those tannins. So it, there's a, a lot of plushness to be had in those wines. Diving back to the short term here, um, you may have noticed that younger wines, um, if you're a winemaker, tend to have really, really vibrant color. So these wines are benefiting from the phenomenon of copigmentation. And this is a molecular level interaction in between pigments like anthocyanins and other flat or planar non-pigmented compounds. And what ends up happening, happening is that these compounds and pigments, they stack up like a stack of pancakes 
the rings that we saw are stacking on top of each other and it changes the way that the light interacts with the compound. So um, this provides a short-term color stability, but this stack isn't actually bonded together like those um, long-term polymerized pigments are. So these things are fated to fall apart in about three to six months. Here is a diagram of a model wine um, that includes copigmentation cofactors and no copigmentation cofactors. And what you can see is when you have those cofactors, the color darkens up so much. As the final kicker for this presentation, we're going to discuss oak and phenolics, which can come from pulp. So these can be concerns that are unique to white wines, but because it's pulp, these compounds can also be in red wines. So these are phenolic acids. In grapes, we have hydroxybenzoic acids and hydroxycinamic acids. These phenolic acids are usually below detection threshold, but as a collective group, they may contribute to some sort of bitterness and they're colorless or pale yellow. And the phenolic acids that are present in oak are called hydrolyzable tannins. And um, these are phenolic acids that are bound to a sugar that can be cleaved off and then those phenolic acids can do work in the wine. So these hydrolyzable tannins here are oak tannins. And hydrolyzable means that they can be hydrolyzed, basically that these linkages are broken down over time. So what we have here is an elagic tannin at the bottom. So this is elagic acid or gallic acids, and then they are attached to a central sugar. And during hydrolyzation, those bonds are broken and the gallic acid and elagic acid are liberated into the wine. So this is still a field of study that's active and we don't really actually understand how these tannins are reacting. People who taste wine absolutely understand that oak tannin has a contribution to making the wine. Um, if you taste oak chardonnays versus unoaked chardonnays, you'll definitely know that these tannins do play a role. However, there hasn't been a lot of research on specifically what's happening here. We do know that they're reactive, but we don't really entirely understand what they're doing. Those hydroxybenzoic acids that I mentioned earlier um, actually do have a pretty well-defined role. They're a good antioxidant, so they can be used in the winemaking process as an antioxidant. Um, and because they are phenolic, they also react with proteins. So an application for this, for gallic acid specifically, which is a hydroxybenzoic acid, is used in uh, cool climate regions where botrytis can be a problem because this gallic acid can react directly with lacase and um, render it um, neutral. So an example here is Lafour's tannin gallicool. Oak tannins are a little bit more confusing. Honestly, there's not much known specifically about what these oak tannins do. So if you've tasted oak aged wines, especially oak aged wines like Chardonnay, you'll know that there's a small contribution of oak tannin. You can taste a small amount of tannin in those wines. But um, this came from the government of Australia um, in a, a report from 2010, so again, 10 years old though. To date, there is no evidence of hydrolyzable tannins forming stable complexes with anthocyanins, nor has the sensory character of hydrolyzable tannins in wine been rigorously examined. So um, this is still a really developing field. We don't know much about what specifically happens with these hydrolyzable tannins, but our palates are telling us that they're doing something. Things get pretty interesting when we start looking at hydroxycinamic acid, which are another type of phenolic acid. So these guys can poly polymerize with phenolics and maybe contribute some bitterness or astringency, but the main issue with them is that they are volatile phenol precursors. So these guys, these hydroxycinamics, are esterified to a tartaric acid in the berry, and that's for solubility purposes but they can be broken down over time by enzymes that are present in different microbes in our wine 
and these can in turn form Brettanomyces volatile phenol aromas. So I'm going to grab my marker here. This is the main guy in the pulp, captaric acid. You can see that we've got a, a tartaric here, or a tartrate, excuse me. And this guy can be oxidized at crush. And what we get is a quinone form of this, which can raft up with other phenolics and induce browning. So here's how these common hydroxyacinomic acids can be turned into volatile phenols. So we can have this hydroxycinamic tartrate ester, which is present in our pulp, and it can be broken down here. We remove the tartrate ester, so we just have a hydroxycinamic acid right here. And then if we have Brettanomyces present, this enzyme here, cinamic acid decarboxylase, can turn this hydroxycinamic acid into a vinyl phenol here. And then if we also have vinyl phenol reductase present, um, we could also get an ethyl phenol, which can also be quite stinky. So here are some examples of these volatile phenols. 4-EP or 4-ethyl phenol has cumaric acid as a precursor, and that can give you your barnard, barnyard or medicinal band-aid aroma. If we have 4-EG or 4-ethyl guaiacol from ferulic acid, we can get that smoky clove flavor. If we have 4-EC or 4 ethyl catechol, we can get that smoky aroma. If we have 4-VP or 4 vinyl phenol from cumaric acid, it's that generic medicinal. And if we have 4 vinyl phenol or 4-VG from ferritaric acid, we get that classic clove aroma. Wow, we made it all the way to the end. So let's review these main compounds here. So the first one we addressed was catechin. So this is a tannin monomer, and it's quite bitter, and it's mainly present in the seeds and the stems. When those little tannin monomers get hooked up into chains, they form condensed tannins. So these can range from dimers, which are just two attached together, all the way up to really large molecules that are so big that they fall out of solution. So these condensed tannins are present in seeds and skins, and um, longer chains are more astringent and shorter chains are more bitter. So the tannins that are more present in skins tend to be longer, closer to 32 of these subunits. And if we take a look at these groups here, it would be this R right here would be an OH. But if this was a seed tannin, we would just have these two hydroxyl groups and we would not have an additional group right there. And those seed tannins tend to be about 10 units long in average, so they tend to be more bitter. And here we have our anthocyanin. And this anthocyanin, its color expression is pH dependent. So closer to pH three, it's gonna be more of a bright red, and closer to pH four, it's gonna be more of a violet blue. And these anthocyanin monomers can be pretty easily bleached. So the way that we need to protect these is to protect this central ring right here. And to do that in a permanent form, we need to form another ring here so that this central ring can't be disrupted. And the way that we do that is binding our anthocyanin to another tannin um, or to another anthocyanin or producing something called a pyranoanthocyanin from um, metabolites from fermentation. And when we have these anthocyanins that are bound up to tannins to form polymeric anthocyanins, the anthocyanin tannin has a smoother texture than just a straight up tannin alone. If you remember that slide with the hand with the raspberries on it, um, that hand is softer and squishier than when it didn't have the raspberries. So when we put anthocyanins on the end of tannins, the tannin also appears more squishy, or rather is perceived to be more squishy. And those hydrolyzable tannins that are present in oak are highly reactive, but we don't really actually understand what they do. So Fans of oak-aged white wines can definitely taste that new oak has a contribution to the wine, not just in terms of aromatics, but also in terms of tannin texture. But there um, hasn't been a lot of research on the actual fates of these hydrolyzable tannins in the wine. So we don't entirely know what they do. If you know what they do, call me. 
Hydroxybenzoic acids are present in the pulp of the berry, so these can exist in both white and red wines. And uh, gallic acid is an example of a hydroxybenzoic acid, and it can be used for lactase management if you utilize a product that has a purified gallic acid in it, because gallic acid as a phenolic reacts with proteins, including lactase. And finally, we have hydroxycinamic acids. So these are also present in the pulp, and these are Brettanomyces aroma precursors. So on their own, they don't cause much problem. They can be oxidized into brown color compounds um, at crush, but really that's the worst of it. But if you have Brettanomyces present in your winery, the enzymes that are unique to Brettanomyces can, can uh, can transform these hydroxycinamic acids into volatile phenols, which can have off aromas like barnyard, um, spicy clove, band aid, sweaty horse, etc. So, thank you so much for tuning in for this lecture on phenolics. Now you can go back to enjoying your day, maybe with your furry best friend, like I'm about to do. Those who have seen my presentations before know that I can't get through a presentation without showing off Mr. Diggs here. So there you go. Thank you so much, and I'll see you next time for another science presentation.